the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Our help is in the name of the Lord. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are here. Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise, and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar, let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ and saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God, merciful Father, in holy baptism you declared us to be your children and gathered us into your one holy church, in which you daily and richly forgive us our sins and grant us new life through your Spirit. Be in our midst, enliven our faith, and graciously receive our prayer and praise. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Have regard for the covenant, O Lord. Let not the downtrodden turn back in shame. Covenant, O Lord, let not the downtrodden turn back in shame.
Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, give us an increase of faith, hope, and charity, and that we may obtain what you have promised, make us love what you have commanded, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Old Testament reading for the 13th Sunday after Trinity is from 2 Chronicles chapter 28. The men of Israel took captive 200,000 of their relatives, women, sons, and daughters. They also took much spoil from them and brought the spoil to Samaria. But a prophet of the Lord was there whose name was Oded. And he went out to meet the army that came to Samaria and said to them, Behold, Because the Lord, the God of your fathers, was angry with Judah, he gave them into your hand. But you have killed them in a rage that has reached up to heaven. And now you intend to subjugate the people of Judah and Jerusalem, male and female, as your slaves. Have you not sins of your own against the Lord your God? Now hear me and send back the captives from the relatives whom you have taken. For the fierce wrath of the Lord is upon you. Certain chiefs also of the men of Ephraim, Azariah the son of Johanan, Berechiah the son of Meshillamoth, Jehizekiah the son of Shalom, and Amasa the son of Hadli, stood up against those who were coming from the war and said to them, You shall not bring the captives in here, for you propose to bring upon us guilt against the Lord in addition to our present sins and guilt. For our, <clears throat> for our guilt is already great. And there is fierce wrath against Israel. So the armed men left the captives and the spoil before the princes and all the assembly. And the men who have been mentioned by name rose and took the captives. And with the spoil, they clothed all who were naked among them. They clothed them, gave them sandals, provided them with food and drink, and anointed them. And carrying all the feeble among them on donkeys, they brought them to their kinsfolk at Jericho the city of palm trees. Then they returned to Samaria. This is the word of the Lord. Epistles from Galatians chapter 3. To give a human example, brothers, even with a man made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it has been ratified. Now, the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. This is what I mean. The law, which came 430 years afterward, does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. For if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by promise, but God gave it to Abraham by a promise. Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made. And it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Now an intermediary implies more than one. But God is one. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks. Thanks. We stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel. God of my salvation, 
I cry out day and night before you. Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 10th chapter. Glory Glory to you, O Lord. Turning to the disciples, Jesus said privately, Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings desired to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you've answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down the road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan... As he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, O Christ. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of His Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit to the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the Scriptures, and is sent in heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.
grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The, uh, you didn't sound sure about that amen. There we go. Um, the uh, gospel lesson serves as the basis of our meditation. Last week we talked about um, look who's talking. Today, the title of our meditation together is this, Look Who's Loving. You have an opportunity now, again, to say your amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord. Pretty much everyone knows the parable of the Good Samaritan. I don't know that everyone knows what's going on. This parable is sort of like the duck-billed platypus of biblical texts. Duck-billed platypus is technically a mammal, but it's kind of hard to classify because it does have some characteristics that are amphibious, right? So today we've got a text where A lawyer asks Jesus, what must I do to be saved? And then Jesus tells him this parable. And so is Jesus actually saying that you have to be this good Samaritan in order to be saved? You read the Bible and you know that can't be true because we're not saved by works of the law. And yet, when Jesus ends this parable... His last words are, go and do likewise. What's going on? How do we make sense of this this parable? Beloved, the question is not how we make sense of this parable. The question is, Does this parable, or how does this parable, make sense of us? So I want to start where we started last week, and I want to remind you that we were created to be in the image of God. Have you ever just sort of sat and lived with that thought for five minutes? What does that mean to be in God's image? How do you measure that? Certainly, it defies description, and yet we can say this for sure. We know that God is love. And if God is love and we are made in His image, then certainly we were created with this God-like capacity to reflect God's love to Him, but then also especially to our neighbor. And there is something powerful, something divine about this capacity that we were endowed with as the creation in God's image. I've been waiting to give this quote, so I'm going to just use this quotation from an educational philosopher and practitioner named Charlotte Mason. Um, Ask Dawn who Charlotte Mason is, and then be prepared to sit there for a while. She's kind of a hero in our house. And she says this, We attempt to define a person, the most commonplace person we know, but he will not submit to bounds. Some unexpected beauty of nature breaks out. We find he is not what we thought, and begin to suspect that every person exceeds our power of measurement. And we see that. We get those glimpses. As we experience people, we see those divine sparks, we'll call them. And this 
especially in a capacity to see a need or a problem and then to use our God-given creativity to do something about it, to use the resources to act in a way that cares for another person. That's what we were created to be. But that's not actually the overarching image that we get, is it? When we look at the world, when we look at ourselves, actually, the thing that's really staring us in the face is that we have been robbed. Jesus tells a story about a man who fell among robbers, was beaten, stripped, and left half dead. We who were created with this capacity to be like God, with, with, with this ability to love, the devil has come and he has stolen this image from us. It happened with Adam and Eve when he invited Adam and Eve to resp- to to think in such a way that God was not good, not to love God, and instead to serve themselves, and so they ate the fruit, and if you'll recall, what happened is they start blaming each other. And the fact is that the devil has been at it ever since. He's doing, with it, doing it to you still. Inviting you to seek first your needs, your cares, your wants, your pleasures, what makes sense to you. And then you've got the world who comes and fills your minds with all sorts of thoughts, gives you new ideas about what matters and what's important. And so you spend your God-given resources or spend t- they're taken from you, as you spend your time, your resources, your thoughts on things that are of no account, no good, evil even. And if that wasn't enough, your own flesh... Your own sinful nature has been a willing participant, has actually led you to believe that serving yourself is what's wanted, so that all of your energy and your resources have been turned inward. And this, your your enemy here is not someone, it would be one thing to point to other people This enemy is ourselves. We've been robbed. Even in seeming godly pursuits, we hear today about a lawyer who puts Jesus to the test and says, what must I do to be saved? And when he's confronted with God's holy law, love God, love your neighbor, then he asks the question, well, who's my neighbor? And we're told he does it to justify himself. If he's doing that, in in that instance, who is he serving? If he has to ask the question, well, who do I have to serve and who do I not have to serve? The final analysis is this. He's serving himself. You see what I mean? Do you know what he's not doing? He's not loving. It's like if someone came up to you and says, I'm starving, and you give them a sandwich, and they ask you, why did you give me a sandwich? And you say, well, because 
I am trying to justify myself before God, trying to earn my way to God, who am I serving? So, friends, here's the tragedy. All the God-given resources, capabilities, riches, they've all been taken from you and you've given them away willingly. Or put it this way, we were robbed and that's actually what we wanted. But, the Good Samaritan. But the Good Samaritan comes and he sees the predicament we're in. The Good Samaritan, did you know this? The Good Samaritan is not you or me. The Good Samaritan is Jesus. We get confused on this. The Good Samaritan is Jesus. Just to make sure this hits home. Would you say that with me? The Good Samaritan is Jesus. You know how I know that? We're specifically told that the Good Samaritan sees the man who half dead. And when he saw him, he had compassion. And I've told you about that word before, splanknizomai, this Greek word that is used to talk about God, and in the gospel lessons, it's used to talk about Jesus. Jesus is the one who has this compassion. He has this drive. He cannot help himself. He sees those in need, and he is moved. And so God, Jesus, the Son of God, was so moved that he left his lofty place in heaven and came to dwell among us where he himself was bereft by the devil, the world, and our sinful nature and hung out to dry on the cross. Hung out to die, I should say. And the Pharisees and the Levites, they all left him. No one actually was found to save. And yet, by the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus overcame and rose again. And he's come to you. Jesus, the outsider Samaritan, the one we didn't even want, came to us anyway, saw us in our beaten and bereft position and he had compassion this week he's seen you where you're at he knows your hurts and he has anointed you with the oil of the spirit given to you in your baptism today He has applied or will apply the wine of Holy Communion. That is the very blood, the very body that he sacrificed. He uses in your life to heal and to strengthen. He has brought you into the inn of his church to convalesce. He has given to pastors the work to continue to apply these gifts of his Holy Word. Now, I don't know that the lawyer, in fact, I'm pretty sure the lawyer, when he hears the story of the Good Samaritan, has no idea that this is about Jesus. But you do. You can't help but see it. Because this is what Jesus is doing for you right here, even today. And Jesus is the one who says to you, go and do likewise. What does he mean by that? 
Is he simply giving us his law that shows us, yeah, you can't do it? Or is there something else going on? When Jesus says to us, go and do likewise, I think he means go and do likewise. He's not playing games. This is not simply a word that condemns us. Now in the Good Samaritan's mouth, this is a word that is a gracious invitation. Jesus is actually indicating to you and to me that we can begin to go and do likewise. That you can actually see the needs of another person, that you can take some time and listen and get to know what it is that they're hurting over, what it is that they need, and as you have been gifted, you use those gifts to serve that person. Of course, because Jesus himself is healing you. And if Jesus is healing you, then he is also revealing to you that your works matter. That your good works actually have value. Because, beloved, your good works conform to God's will. That must be good. They have value because good works are God's work in you. Your good works have value because they actually serve as a testimony to the fact that Christ is healing you. Your works have value. In fact, they have more value than heaven and earth because heaven, the heavens and the earth will pass away. But Revelation 14.13 says that blessed are those who die in the Lord from now on. Why? Because their works follow them. The heavens and the earth and all the material possessions of this earth, those things are all going to be consumed, but your good works continue on. I don't get how this works. I'm just saying that your good Samaritan who loves you has now invited you to follow him. To go and do likewise. The robbers have not prevailed. You needed to hear this today. The robbers have not prevailed. Because you've been watching TV, you've been seeing all the ugly things, you've been looking at the news, and you've seen how ugly humans can be, and what you need to know is that the robbers have not prevailed. You are not bereft of God's blessing, his favor, his gifts. In fact, the revelation is that in Christ Jesus, who became one of you, he is lifting you up to a new place, a new status. Ephesians chapter 1 says that Jesus has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Verse 11 says that in Christ we have obtained an inheritance. Verse 14 says, You have been given the Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we take possession of it. Beloved, you are not bereft. You are blessed. Your problem is not, you with me? Your problem is not that you don't have enough. 
Your problem is that you don't realize how much you have right now. How loved you are. How given to. How all of heaven, all of God's riches, bestowed upon you. And that's what Jesus is inviting you into when he says, go and do likewise. That's what he's inviting you to see and to believe. Maybe this parable still doesn't make sense fully to you. It doesn't matter. The key thing is that this parable is continuing to make sense of you in your life. Hungry man comes up to you. You don't give him a sandwich because you're proving anything to God or to anyone else. You're not trying to justify yourself. So when the man comes up to you and is hungry and you give him a sandwich and he says, thank you so much, why did you do that? You simply say, because I noticed you were hungry. I wanted to care for you. Is that just a little no account work that just is going to go away? Or is this a new life that you walk in, that you live in every day? Beloved, you have everything. And the fun part of life is you get to use it to love people. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. May the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the ministry of Christ, the faithful priest, whose oil and wine alone heal all wounds, remove the curse of the law, and bring into eternal rest. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the ministers of the new covenant, that they would proclaim forgiveness, life, and salvation in Christ, drawing all nations into the people of God. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. That God would cut short his wrath against our sin, Make room for repentance and forgive us for Christ's sake. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who fall into sin, that they would be brought to repentance and not rebuked beyond measure, but rather be returned to the communion of the faithful. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the Lord's gift of marriage, that he would preserve it against the ravages of sin, the schemes of the devil, and the raging of the world and for the couples and families of our congregations, that God would strengthen them in love for one another and establish them on the foundation of his word. And we remember all the saints at Zion Lutheran Church in Red Cloud. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For earthly rulers, that they would promote the good and punish the evil, exercising restraint in their judgments, so that goodness and grace may be established in our land. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For Wellspring, the David Preuss family, Heartland Lutheran High School, and Zion Classical Academy, that in their service, that love would abound as they care for those with whom they serve. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this congregation, as we prepare to celebrate our 75th anniversary, that we would be moved by God's eternal, infinite love toward us to continue to celebrate with one another, love one another, and serve our neighbors. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For Kelly, Andy, June, Bill, Linda, Kara, Don, John, and Dee, and whoever has been wounded by the wicked of the world, 
that the grace of Christ would soothe, uplift, and carry them through their trials. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those mourning the loss of Modesta, that they would see in Christ that what is taken from them will be restored a hundredfold, and that they would be strengthened by the certainty of the resurrection of the body and a happy reunion in heaven with all who've loved and waited for Christ's return. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. All these things and whatever else you know that we need. Father, for the sake of him who died and rose again, and now lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Everlasting God for the countless blessings you so freely bestow on us and all creation. Above all, we give thanks for your boundless love shown to us when you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into our flesh and laid on him our sin, giving him into death that we might not die eternally. Because he is now risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity, all who believe in him will overcome sin and death and will rise again to new life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, We laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of all creation, for you have had mercy on us and given your only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. In your righteous judgment, you condemned the sin of Adam and Eve who ate the forbidden fruits, and you justly barred them and all their children from the tree of life. Yet in your great mercy, you promised salvation by a second Adam, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and made his cross a life-giving tree for all who trust in him. We give you thanks for the redemption you have prepared for us through Jesus Christ. Grant us your Holy Spirit that we may faithfully eat and drink of the fruits of his cross and receive the blessings of forgiveness, life, and salvation that come to us in his body and blood. Hear us as we pray in his name and as he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sin. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me.
The peace of the Lord be with you always.
body and blood of our Lord and Savior, strengthen and preserve you both body and soul to life everlasting. Depart in peace. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy, you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.